Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of the Midwest Gaming Classic Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Garris, Panel Director of the Midwest Gaming Classic. We travel back and discuss Final Fantasy VI, 30 years of the greatest RPG of all time. Four out of five retro knots agree. It's time to celebrate a masterpiece. Bob Mackey, Diamond Feet, and Nadia Oxford look back three decades and ten numbered entries to dig into Super NES classic Final Fantasy VI and explore what made it so mind-blowing in 1994 and such a joy to return to 30 years later. Just don't call it Final Fantasy III. And you know what? Enough of me talking. Why don't we get to the podcast? Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rock Welcome to the Rock Class panel live at Midwest Game Classic 2024. Apparently, this is the most full panel to date. We have the draw of one American Gladiator. That is our power as a podcast. Uh, I apologize to Power. I respect him. I am afraid of him. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Bob Mackey. Who is serving today? Uh, unfrozen Cane Man S for a Diamond Fight! And who else is here? Uh, half S for about to wig out, Nadia Oxford. Yes, we all know that we're out of trance mode, in my case, extreme anxiety. Because uh, the leader of our group, Jeremy, could not make it today. We were on the floating continents, and we had about 30 seconds left, and I was like, oh, he's not going to make it. So uh, now we're in the world, world of ruin, uh, because uh, we are going to wing it to talk about one of the greatest RPGs of all time, Final Fantasy VI. Uh, it turns out we're going out, please, sir. So, uh, yes, we're here today to talk about it. Uh, by the way, it's not Final Fantasy III. If you refer to it by that name, you will be ejected from this auditorium. Uh, I, I see some uh, guilty parties being pointed out in the audience. Well, we'll take care of you later. But yes, Final Fantasy III released obviously in 1994, uh, making us all feel very old. But uh, it was Square hitting peaks in storytelling and mechanics and music and just so many great Hallmark things happening with that game. Um, I guess we can talk about our history of the game to start off with. Uh, let's start with uh, Silicon okay. History. Did you just say my name? I didn't hear you. Then. Yes. Okay, okay, yes. My um, life, grab it. My personal history with Final Fantasy uh, III slot, uh, Final Fantasy VI is, uh, of course, I played it on the SNES. I still have the original cartridge. Uh, my characters were all named after Power Rangers, because it was that time <laughs> in the 90s. And uh, I I've told the story before, so if you listen to my podcast, I'm sorry if you're hearing it again. But um, are there any Canadians in the house? Yeah, okay. Yeah, come back on. If you pay enough money, they'll leave Well, there's a, if, you, if anyone remembers in the 90s, like everybody was selling video games. Like you could go anywhere and buy a video game. And for some reason, a hardware chain called Canadian Tire was selling Final Fantasy VI, and that's where I bought it. And I had like only, I had most of the money, but my dad had to kind of spot me because uh, with tax and everything, it was like $115. So those cartridges were very, very expensive. And he said, okay, I'll get it for you, I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'll get the rest, but you have to give me the Canadian Tire money. Because back then, when you bought something, you would get a little bit back in like Canadian Tire money, which was like funny money, but uh, it was good at the store. So he spent that money to get it for me, and I paid him back. But when he spent the money, the cashier saw the price and said, like, yeah, wow, this must be for a very special person. And my dad said, nah. <laughs> So that's my history. I played it um, to death. I think it was one of the games I would say that really inspired me to become a writer because uh, Ted Woolsey, a localizer I admire very much, like he resolved to treat the script as as reverently as possible, and he did. Like he saw this game and said, "This is a story for adults." I mean, to be honest, like the 30th anniversary just went by for Final Fantasy VI, uh, and I, the only way I can think to really pay tribute to it was to say thank you to the first game that treated me like an adult. And Daniel, what's your history with me? Well, 
Uh, it's much shorter than Nadia's because... I ramble. No, 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 no. Not a, I'm rather the storytelling length. I'm talking about the, the, the actual number of time that's passed because I did not play this on Super Nintendo. Uh, I played the original Final Fantasy, and then I only played one Final Fantasy on Super Nintendo, and that was Mystic Quest. Woo! And many years later, I, I found out that the other games were actually a little more uh, acclaimed. So I... Recently, not that long ago, I played Final Fantasy IV, aka 2, and I thought it was really great. And so with the anniversary coming up, and more importantly, this podcast coming up, I was like, well, I guess I better finally get around to playing 6, because, I mean, over the years, that game's been available on many different platforms. I've bought it digitally multiple times, including the, the Pixel remasters, which I think are really nice, by the way. I'm sure we'll talk about them, but... So I've been playing it just throughout. Even on this vacation, I'm still playing it, and... You know, it's, it's good. I mean, these people are here, I think it's a good game. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I'm not here to insult it. Uh, yeah, as for me, I, I was there on the ground floor as a 12-year-old in 1994. You can speculate on my age after the uh, uh, panel. And uh, yeah, I remember very clearly it cost seventy two ninety nine, which I could not imagine anything costing more. And I think with inflation, that's probably the cost of a one-bedroom apartment in Milwaukee. Just, just the, uh, the deposit, at least. But yes, obsessed with it since then, uh, always drawing Moogles in my notebooks. Uh, could not convince any friends to like the games until Final Fantasy VII came out. But yeah, and I, I recently played through it again, Pixel Remastered. This is not an advertisement, but just a great way to re-experience the game. So many quality of life improvements, so many bug fixes. But uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about uh, how Final Fantasy changed over the years. So essentially, uh, this was not a rule they were following, but the odd entries were basically the rule book entries of Final Fantasy, and the even entries were the campaign book. Um, meaning that the even entries were more focused on storytelling, the odd entries were more focused on mechanics. That's true up to a point. Yes. But it does seem like, uh, I, I, I see something that Sakaguchi said uh, at the time. Yeah, I found this quote from the 25th anniversary, um, which is now five years ago, so you know, and he said, quote, people say that the odd numbered Final Fantasy games are system based and the even numbered ones are story based, but it's just not determined that way. It's simply a matter of the creators getting tired and not wanting to do things the same way as the last time. So they're just changing the way it's presented. That was translated by Brian Clark. Woo. Hey, hey, Brian Clark. One million power, Brian Clark. Thank you. Through his website. So yes, uh, going over the history of the series of the six, so Final Fantasy III introduced the job system, had a uh, fairly light story, not the characters. The, the DS version tried to add some characterization to them, but essentially they're empty shells. Then we have uh, FF4, which created a structured quest with a cast of characters whose fixed classes define them in some way. So now it's more about exploring the story of like what is a summoner, what is a dark knight, etc. So looking for ways to filter story through these mechanics. And then we have five, which everyone loves, and um, it upgraded the job system. It's just like a beefed up Final Fantasy III. Uh, but the characters are not too interesting. Uh, I'm sorry for all of you Bart fans. Uh, that's, that's what we're calling you now, right? Yeah, you can't talk shit about Kryl. They can't do that. Kryl? Okay. She signed that book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Gullif died so Kryl Kryl could live. Is that what happened in that game? Yes, uh, Gullif died so that Kryl may live. It's the reason for the season. (laughs) And uh, I feel there's a big bridge. There's a big bridge. There's a big bridge. I'll fall off it. That that started all the big bridges. (laughs) Uh, And then we have six we're talking about today, which takes all the roles of FF five, adds some new ones in and turns all of these classes into a cast of characters with personalities and personal quest lines. So, uh, basically, beefing up what 4 did. Uh, 4 was an extrapolation of what was going on in 1. This is an extrapolation of what was going on in, in 3 and 5 in terms of the mechanics. Uh, anything else to add about just the, uh, the growth of the series over these first six installments? I mean, Bob, the way you laid it out like that, it sounds like no one cares about 2. Uh, I like 2. 2 has its problems. I'm not going to play it anytime soon, but it's basically 2 is the larval stage of 4. You have the angsty Dark Knights, you have the Dragoons, you have all the good shit that eventually gets built upon in 4. But it's, it, it 2 got hit in the head so that 4 may walk. 
Right. Well, it hit itself in the head, right? Yeah. Well, yes. he, yeah. That's how it hit itself in the head. Well, well, right. It's no in most of its organs before. <laughs> so it's. Uh, I mean, I tried. I've tried multiple times to play too. Uh, the Japanese too, and uh, I just can't do it. But I know with the Pixar Master again, not a man. Uh, they did make a lot of quality of life improvements. So maybe this time. But I think like maybe fourth time, jokes on me. If I try it again. Uh, so the creators of the game, uh, we have here Nobu Sakaguchi, he's the godfather of the series. At this point, he was um, promoted to a like, uh, vice president role at Square, so he had to be last hands-on. Uh, and the other creators are Yoshinori Kitase, who is the planner or director of the game, uh, the narrative director as well, and also Hiroyuki Ito, who is the guy behind the battle system, uh, just building off of what came before in the series so far. And then uh, a guy whose name is pretty known to most RPG fans, it's Soya Nomura, who at this point was drawing monsters, uh, but also created the two most emo of the heroes, which are Shadow and Setzer. Uh, he would not step into a much bigger role until the next game, obviously, and define the look of FF for a while after that. Um, more people involved, we have uh, Kazuko Shibuya. She made all of the very cute battle sprites and SD characters on the Japanese packaging, and if you play those remasters, she has uh, basically recreated all the sprites to work better with non-CRT I, I think she did a great job. I know yeah. there's a lot of controversy around the sprites, but uh, those sprites, of course, were made during the day of the days of CRT, where you expected a certain amount of smear. And I understand people now are kind of like angry about preservation and whatnot, but looking at Terra's original 16-bit sprite on a HD TV as it was on the SNES is a uh, not quite as attractive, as, as as clean and easy to define, yeah, nicely defined as it is in the Pixel Remaster. I think they did a great job. Yeah, they're, they're really fantastic. And also I read that um, she did all her sprite work for those characters like first, and then I guess they called the mono in to like draw like, the fancy versions. So that if you look at like the variety of art over the years, you can see some discrepancies. Like apparently a mono made everybody blonde. And uh, behind the scenes, they're like, we can't have an entire cast being blonde. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're, you got green hair now, lady, sorry. Um, but just, but just it's for the better, because honestly, yeah. you know, especially if they're all the characters this tall, you, you really got to have some, some color in there. Yeah, upon playing the remaster recently, it made me realize how many of the male characters have ponytails. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's mullet town. Now they're all just so accurately depicted. There's no worry about the CRT smear. So, She's involved, she's a big part of uh, FF as well. And also, Nobuo Uematsu, who is uh, the music guy for FF, arguably at his peak performance with this game, uh, hitting new heights, doing a lot of great things with light motifs. Every character has a theme, uh, variations of it are played throughout the game. Uh, fantastic soundtrack. Uh, I, it really speaks for itself, and it's one of the most popular soundtracks in the uh, FF uh, library. It's kind of remarkable what uh, Yomatsu did with the cartridge because you have the ending song, which does not loop. It is like a 20-minute ending that has the original song on top of Dancing Mad, which is a three-tiered, sorry, four-tiered song. It is absolutely insane. And you know a game has good music when you have parents who don't play games, but they are musicians, and they say, wow, that game has really good music. Like, if my dad heard a Nintendo game, he's like, well, that sounds like shit. What's wrong with that? But like, with the... Uh, the, with with um, the Final Fantasy VI, my parents were pretty impressed, especially with the opera. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the few or only Super Nintendo games where there are maybe two 17-minute songs on the soundtrack, the, the Dancing <laughs> Man and the ending. Dancing Man might be 13 or something. But uh, yeah, nobody was writing game music that long. Um, no, and, not only cartridge especially. Especially for 1994. So, uh, we can go over the story. We're going to go over the different elements of the game and talk about why they're so great. So, uh, the game begins in the middle of the story. Things have already happened. You don't know who you are. You get this really neat credit scroll over essentially a cutscene from 1994. And, uh, yeah, basically, this, along with other Final Fantasies of the day, are very inspired by uh, Star Wars. And uh, because it's taking place in the 90s, you play uh, essentially a group of terrorists, but they're the good guys, and you're out to destroy the Empire. And uh, I think I see a quote here from the, uh, the sprite designer, Diamond. Yeah, um, speaking to what I was raised earlier, so Shibuya talked about how she worked you know, really hard on these sprites, and she was just surprised at how the many ways they were used, because, you know, I feel like Final Fantasy VI, even more than the earlier entries, they're really pushing the boundary of what they can do with the characters as is, you know, you've got you've got you know this this heart, this central 
band of you know heroes you're working with, and you got a bunch of monsters. And the heroes and the monsters don't really look like they come from the same planet. Um, which was, one of the moments I think was really funny to me is when the um, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, I changed the names when I played Fallen Six, so I, I'm, I'm not on top of the names of everyone. So Sabi is like the martial arts guy, right? Yes, yeah, This is when you meet him, like he has to face up against one of his other like disciples or his like fellow student. And on the yeah, on the screen, you've got this giant like you know buff you know buff you know. Ripple dude, and he's got a lot of detail in his drawing. And across from him is this little cartoon man with a ponytail, and you have to fight him against one another. It's like, you are you related? Are you the same species? Like, what the hell is going on here? Well, no, he can't actually. <laughs> Sam just suplex him, which I, I think he could do to him, but you're supposed to use the. I, I grew up with the original translation, so to me it's called Pummel, but I, I don't remember what it's called in the retranslation. But because the game is all built around, you know, manipulating these little characters, uh, Shibuya said that she drew them in all sorts of different animations, like waving and painting. And since the characters have the same proportions on both the world map and in the battle, you could use the animations in any scene. So when she saw the completed cutscenes, she was surprised at the use of the character graphics in ways I didn't think of them to be used in. Um, and one that comes down to me is, I think in one of the uh, one of the jail cells, if you examine the toilet, you just jump on the toilet. And you use it. Yeah, I guess. Yes. I guess that's the implication. So, I guess while you're visiting Kafka in jail, you can just take a piss, which is, I mean, you know. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the only toilet that's in the game, you need to use them. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you're right, uh, Diamond. The acting had really evolved since uh, Final Fantasy 4 and 5 because I think all of the acting in those games is a character just putting their head down or raising one hand. Yeah. And you have to get every possible emotion out of that. And I think FF5 even had like little uh, emoticon balloons, like an exclamation point or a question mark, but that was it. But here you have uh, a huge degree of emotions per character. I mean, it seems really primitive now, but uh, it was very strange to see that many unique sprites for all the 14 playable characters. Yeah, actually I went back to Final Fantasy IV after six, and I was like, oh, okay, I can definitely see where six did was a bit of an upgrade. So yeah, the game starts off standard, uh, scrappy group of uh, uh, heroes fighting the evil empire, and the big twist is uh, that the bad guys win. And uh, for me, you know, playing this game in 1994, not having the internet, I was stuck on the floating continents dungeon for a very long time. Um, and it wasn't until I returned to it months later that I finished it, thinking that would be the end of the game. And then secretly surprised with another back half of the game, which is something that they did a lot more often back then, I feel, like hiding. Although, I must have been a dumb child because the poster that comes to the game has one side that says World of Balance, one side that says World of Ruin. <laughs> I don't know what I assume World of Ruin meant, but I, I wasn't able to put the pieces together. It meant to go to Disneyland. Uh, personally, myself, I actually rented the game before I bought it, and um, back then, we usually had other people's saves with bad names for the characters, of course, but. I remember I, pl I was playing the game, The World of Balance, and I was like, oh, this is really cool, I love this, and I think I got stuck by the, the Esper Cave before I had to give the game back, but I did check someone's uh, save file where they were close to the end of the game, and it was like, holy shit, this is a whole new game, what is this? Because the sky was red, the ground was all screwed up, it was just like, not that, but that spurred me on, I said, I have to find out what happened here, and what did I find out? Yeah, I was so, I was, I was in shock when it happened, because the, the, the way the game was building up, I just assumed that this was indeed coming to the end. Like, you know, you yeah. have, you're in this fun new landmass, you know, there's a lot of really tough monsters. The game is telling you, oh, right up ahead, that's where that's where everybody is. And, you know, you had, you had a couple of twists up to that point, you know, it, it looked like the Emperor was indeed very, very sorry. And, you know, I was, it was, <laughs> I thought it was a little funny that we had to go to the castle and we had to have dinner with him. And we yes. had to, like, we had to walk around and talk, like, talk to as many soldiers as you can. I'm like, Hey, isn't this your job, dude? But uh, <laughs> I mean, that part of the game became an episode of Frasier. <laughs> yeah. that, that was a weird sequence, though, because actually playing that in the Pixel Remaster uh, lately, it's like, okay, talk to my soldiers, and they all say very sad things. It's like, <laughs> oh, I killed too many people, I won't have a normal life, my family's all dead, what's the point? Like, do you want a uh, peace? Yay! Right, so you have all this stuff, and then you have the moment, oh, wait, no, this, this weird clown is actually going to be in charge now. And then the, it seems like you're building this finale where it's going to be, you know, the Emperor and the Clown, and I guess the Clown's probably going to betray him, maybe, but then we'll have to fight the Clown. But then it's like, no, it's, uh, they, they just win, and uh, our hero, like, falls asleep for a year, and then starts collecting fish. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess part of the angle of this game was that there was no uh, defined protagonist. I mean, Terra is on the box. 
But once you start the second half of the game, you basically, well, after you uh, acquire the necessary people you need to get the airship, you can basically go right to the tower, or you can make a party up of whoever you want. Like, Mog could be the protagonist. Uh, Umaro could become the protagonist, although I will mark my that. Uh, but yeah, just that was a very uh, like groundbreaking thing for a Japanese RPG that are usually very linear. And, that's what the big surprise is in the second half of the game. The first half, very prescribed, here are your parties for different scenarios, it plays just like FF4 would, and then when the World of Ruin happens, after a certain point, a few hours in, it just says, okay, collect who you want, um, find whatever you want to find, and, and then beat the game whenever you feel like it, which feels like a much more uh, Western-style move at that time. It's also kind of an unapologetic game because when I played the game, I hadn't been using Celeste at all, and then all of a sudden, like, hey, this is your only character that you have to deal with. I had to actually build her up so she wouldn't die every time she stepped outside. And then it's like, okay, then you can get Sabin. Oh, here's Tara. Oh, nope, nope, no Tara. And then you maybe get Edgar, and then you're finally free to kind of go around and find who you, can want, who you want, but it's not like your characters have built up all that much after the apocalypse if you hadn't been using them very much. Yeah, I thought the game did a lot of clever stuff to make you sort of have to deal with all these people in different ways. Like, when you have that branch point where, like, I think they're in the falls, and, like, they all get separated, and the game's like, okay, so who do you want to, who, whose story do you want to follow? And it's not a single choice because, like, whoever you choose, you go back to that one moment, it's like, all right, so, two more. And I'm like, oh, shit, they really want me to do all this stuff, you know? Because the first time I did it, I went through and I picked... I picked the, the Sabi storyline, which was I got to, you know, got, yes, I got to put the train, and yes, of course, like, I threw the train to the ground, you know, like garbage. Um, and then it's like, okay, two more. I'm like, wait, that was such a long story. How long is he? And it's like, it's kind of weird that, that his story is super long. The other two were just like, oh, yeah, yeah, we just, yeah we're, we're, going to, we're going to the waterfall. Oh, we're done. Yay. It's like, Okay. Yeah, long story is very short. She well, not extremely short, but he has that kind of puzzle where you have to beat up people and take their clothes. And I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> oh God! Oh my God! It was, I was really like, I didn't expect that to be resolved the way it was. I was, you know, you're in that town and like, oh, somebody's seeking around, somebody's seeking, right? And this one guy keeps fighting me, but I beat him every time because he's a wuss. And I'm like, wait, wait, can I can I steal his clothes? And I could. And they hold the special part of the guy with his boxer shorts. Like, oh, birthday suit? Yes. <laughs> yeah, birthday suit. I mean, yeah, I, I talk, I talk about the content. Uh, it seems pretty tame now, but this was released, I think, before any sort of ring system? Is there... It was basically right at the edge of any sort of ring yeah. system. If you play this game, um, you will be, I mean, one of the reasons I respect Ted Wilson so much is in the 90s, he, like, Nintendo was like, you cannot say die, you cannot say death, you cannot allude to death. And this is a game about a clown destroying the world and killing millions of people, presumably. So he came out with every, like, he took the thesaurus and just, like, bashed the shit out of it, because, like, think about the fact that you're, when your party dies, it just says annihilated. That's okay. Even I feel that's a much harsher word than, oh, you are dead. Annihilated. Okay, whatever, Nintendo, here you go. Yeah, because when you meet the samurai, like, you meet the samurai, and then, like, two minutes later, you meet his family, and you find out his family, or they've all got poisoned all by, dead. you know, by the clown. And, you know, <laughs> then you're on this, you know, then you're on, like, the death... The, 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 whatever, the, the phantom train, the shadow train, and you got ghosts everywhere. So it's like, it's very clearly, you know, they're just they're just covering their tracks a little bit. But yeah, uh, Bob, what you were saying, this was this was early '94, so the video game violence hearings were like late '93, and I think the ESRB started like at the end of '94. Yeah. So like, yeah. Mortal Kombat 2 shows up on Super Nintendo, and it has like a you know I'm arguing about violent content. So I don't know when it was it was. Fair. Excuse me, it was April in Japan. I don't know the actual release date in the US, so it was just later in 94. It's like October. For, right. To myself, like, I noticed a bit, I noticed a shift with, between, like, Final Fantasy IV and Chrono Trigger and then Breath of Fire II. That was when the ESRB kicked in, or was about to, and they had, like, nothing censored. Like, everyone said damn a lot for some reason. Uh, there was, uh, your, your whole mission was to kill God. And that was not something you saw in video games until Nintendo said, okay, whatever, deal with your own shit, we're done. Yeah, uh, Rustin Howard, Joe Lieberman. <laughs> yes, you got the crossroads, honey. Uh, <laughs> you got the crossroads. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Mortal Kombat was upon us when this game was out. Uh, but yeah, this I, this is the darkest shit I've ever seen as well, where there's, attempted, there's an attempted suicide scene. You hear about uh, war and casualties. 
you watch a genocide unfold on the screen because everyone had just went to the big water drinking party. <laughs> there's, a, um, there's teen pregnancy in Christ. Yeah, there's teen pregnancy, which is barely disguised if it is, is at all. I, don't think. Yeah. I think they tried to make them married, but it didn't work out. Like Everyone knew you were joking. <laughs> yes, and there was no uh, Christian church to marry. Uh, They're 16 when, years old. Yes. And the world's ending. Who married them? The dog? Yeah. Stories of teen pregnancy, stealing clothes from people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, a, lot, a lot of first day content for the era. So let's talk about the characters. Uh, we're going to be recording a separate uh, ranking episode to put all these guys against each other later. But basically, um, every character is assigned a class. And in the U.S. version, this is not evident because their class titles were obscure. They wouldn't be as well known to the American players at this point. But it's more clear in later versions. Um, but yeah, every character has a special class-specific skill you need to them. Every character can eventually gain magic abilities. Uh, every character can attack and use items. And uh, some have magic naturally, uh, you know, if the plot deems it necessary, like Terra and Celeste. So we can talk about all these, maybe throw out a few comments, because there's 14, which is uh, a nutty number for an 1994 RPG. So we have Terra, she's the poster girl for FF6. She's a half Esper. She can use an ability called Trance to power up her abilities. I believe the more you use it, the longer it will last in the future. Uh, Terra Thoughts, not Tina. Originally named Tina, where we're Terra backers, aren't we, on this, uh, this guy? Yeah, for sure. I'm a Terra person because the way I hear it in Japan, Tina sounds exotic, but uh, I think Ted Woolsey made it Terra because that sounds more exotic to people here, whereas in, uh, here we think Tina, I think, I don't know, Tina Turner, I don't know, but like, uh, yeah, I think Terra's. And I mean, your hair is green, kind of matches that Earth aesthetic. Yeah, I, I called her Minty because of the green hair. I, I didn't know. That's cute, I like that. And she does become a, a pink Minty to you. Um, so we also have Locke, uh, who is the thief of the crew. And it, it's very odd that you kind of start off with a thief as one of your main characters. But it fits in with these, these plucky rough around the edges returners you're playing with. But yeah, obviously, he can steal, and he's the only party member that can do that. So uh, he's very useful in terms of getting important items from bosses and enemies and getting elixirs and all those uh, fun things that are usually hard to find. I thought it was really funny that you introduced, you, you meet this character really early and yeah, he's supposed to be some sort of, you know, he, he insists he's a treasure hunter and everyone's like, no, you, you steal stuff. Um, which I think is really funny. I don't know if they were actually trying to comment on you know, how much museums are full of stolen goods from other countries, but uh, in any case it made me laugh. And it's funny, you, you sort of meet this guy and you assume he's going to be some sort of pluckish rogue who, you know, who's traveling, who's traveling around breaking hearts, but you find out, no, no, he's really upset because he had one girlfriend and then sort of lost her because she had a, you know, there was, there was a problem there. And then he just kind of works into like a love triangle because, you know, he meets Tara and I think they sort of have a thing maybe, but then he meets the other lady later on with the general, with Sarah, is it? I, Celeste, I think Celeste, that, that basically, uh, Locke has problems and he projects that onto Tara. This whole thing is like, I'll protect women no matter what. And, I don't think his, well, God, I'm not going to start shipping more here, but I don't think his thing about Tara was so much romantic as that, okay, i got to protect you because you're a girl. Then he met Celeste, and um, we'll probably go into this later, but I absolutely love the, the, the love story behind Celeste and Locke. I find it's very screwed up and adult, which is uh, extremely suitable. And the way it is is basically Locke and Celeste are in love, but Locke, Celeste cannot handle loving Locke until she's sure that Locke is not going to call her Rachel in bed. That is the whole thing. <laughs> They, they really have to bury that girl, I think. <laughs> you can't just leave her lying around like that. No. Um, she leads so away, Bob. She's crazy like a Jedi. That's right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Celeste, uh, we talked about her. She's the room knight. She's one of the early characters that can use magic. Very useful. Uh, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I, I don't really understand her rune ability. I never figured out a good use for it outside of the one boss fights. Yeah, it's necessary. I've been using Runic so much, and I do not understand how it works at all. I do not think there's a special guy in the tutorial hut who's like, "Do you want to know about Runic?" Like, "Yes, please tell me." And he, and I read it again. And I'm like, "That guy, I don't get it. Still don't get it." But it is useful. It absorbs all magic, even the good stuff you want to cast. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah, but it's extremely useful in the world of Rune. You're fighting uh, that stupid demon Humbaba because uh, he'll he has some pretty powerful spells, and you're only with Celeste and Sabin, but you can like absorb his poison and lightning spells. So yeah, that's Les. Uh, we also have Edgar, who uh, I think is OP, but I love Edgar. He's so OP. He's yeah. so broken. Oh my god, I love Edgar. Uh, I mean, his tools, he has a vast array of tools you can buy, and they're all basically very powerful spells, essentially, with no MP use. Once you have Drill, it's just like you've won the game, because yeah. that can go through all defenses. 
And chainsaw, chainsaw. Chainsaw is great too. Like, and the this, but even if you don't find the chainsaw, because you have to have a whole puzzle for that. The drill, like, you know, it like costs like a hundred gold or something stupid, and it's just like, okay, here I come. It's funny that, um, yeah, the, the Edgar, the king, the king, the king of some small territory, is kind of like he's the skirt chaser. I thought the treasure hunter thief guy would be. He's one yeah. like every time you meet someone around the castle, they're like, "Oh, the king where did we get today?" It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that that seems like a, a breach of breach of trust. If he's the no. king, he shouldn't be doing that. Edgar is not surviving uh, me too. Uh, uh, no, he's certainly not. Uh, uh, they clean up this interaction with Bram, I'll say. That's all, that's all I'll say. Uh, set in, I believe, in the Japanese version known as like Mesh or Meshu, or yeah. yeah, something like that. Or Matthew, maybe. So, a monk, uh, super, super powerful. Uh, essentially, they were co opting a little bit of the Street Fighter fandom by letting you control a RPG character by inputting, you know, your standard fireball motions and so on. And thankfully, in the newer versions, it just shows you what to put in. But in yeah. the past, you just had a, a blank entry window, and you just did the motion, and pretty God it works. Oh my god, <laughs> the original didn't tell you what to do? No, 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 no. no. let me tell you how I would have been so angry. Let me tell you how stuff I got in Vargas, because you had to do the combo, I'm like, I don't get this, mom. <laughs> and then there was a problem where it's like, LRL, does that mean the L button? <laughs> or the the left the left on the D-pad. So yeah, seven rules. Uh, weirdly enough, he's a monk, but he can't do dual attacks uh, from the start. You have to get the energy love. So that's one way to make him a little weaker, uh, not overpowered. Now we have Gao. Um, he's a berserker. You basically learn monster skills and perform them in battle. And uh, it takes a lot of work to get Gao up and running and, and functional in your party. Maybe they make it easier now, but. He's a guy I normally leave behind uh, outside of the few instances where like, oh, I taught him the stray cat move and it's the most powerful thing I can do at this one moment in time. But you have to find the stray cat, that's the thing. On the yeah. uh, on the belt, you find random groups of enemies. And what I do is if I get Gao, I'll stick around for like five minutes and if I get the Pterodon Rage, which is Fireball, that'll take me through the entire world of balance practically. Yeah, I mean, he can use important skills, but once, just like another character, once you set him going, he's kind of trapped on yeah. auto battle. He can't so stop. he can't heal, he can't do anything else. So if you have an enemy that's like, you know, uh, absorbs fire and he's using fire, well, screw you. Yeah, I, I actually had to restart so many battles that way. But I, I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm set him up like, okay, we've been fighting people for like an hour in this dungeon. I'll just, here's the boss. I'm, I'll see Rome with the same attack I've been doing all the time. I'm like, oh no, the boss loves fire. He loves it. And I'll give me more. Oh, very well. Thank God for the uh, So we have to speed through some of these to get more stuff to cover. Uh, Shadow is a cool ninja with a dog, Interceptor. Uh, Shadow will join your party temporarily. You can hire him and uh, he'll leave on his own free will. But once you get him in the second half of the game, he's, he's with you for life. You Once you find him in the world of Ruin, like, uh, he's with you for good. But Shadow to Shadow because uh, it's a very rare instance of Square using very subtle storytelling. The Shadow is Clyde Aroni, who is Realm's father, and uh, you can find a lot of hints, including Shadow's Dreams, if any of you got the shit skit out of you, like I did, like, it was 3 a.m., I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to the inn and save, and I'll go to bed, and suddenly, like, this horrible noise comes up, and it's just, like, this terrible, subtle, like, this guy comes and starts saying really cryptic things to me, which was even more cryptic in the original translation, because it wasn't quite right. So that, uh, that left an impression. But if you put everything together, yes, you find out Shadow is Realm's father and he ditched her, as good fathers do, I suppose. Super powerful and uh, especially with the thrill ability. He's one of the guys you can just lose forever, though, uh, in what I reference up front. And they're not very clear about uh, telegraphing that you can no, lose him. No, I missed him the first time around. Me too. not wait for him. Because you, like, you said you had a terrible time in the dungeon in the, uh, the floating continent, so I'm like, I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, the problem is not even like, do you want to wait for Shadow? It's just like, leave now? Basically, so it's not implying that uh, you're waiting for anyone. No, no. Yeah. That so we have uh, Cyan up next, uh, Samurai. Uh, one of the big uh, important improvements they made to him with the universe of the game is his ability before, you had to wait for a meter to slowly build up and then remember what each of the numbers signify. Yeah. In, in our modern world of post pixel remaster, you just select the tech. And it just goes to work, and it's such, uh, it makes him so less tedious to use. Yeah, and shout out to the Rage Translation, where you find, you always find a dirty magazine in a Final Fantasy game, it's like a tradition at this point, and of course that wasn't something we did in the original SNES translations. So you found a magazine, you find a magazine that Cyan is hiding in the World of Ruin, and I can't remember the name of it in the original translation, but the 
the new translation is called Bushido in the Bedroom. Not that it's brilliant. <laughs> and if you find it, he's so like worked up about it. Yeah, I guess you couldn't do that kind of pun with uh, Sortek, which was the first. Sortek in the sack. The, uh, the, the first thing we know about Bushido until uh, that Tom Cruise movie, right? Yeah. More like Sword Dick. <laughs> That's all I got. We're gonna move on to uh, Mog. Now, I personally love Mog. He was the mascot for the game in the U.S. He's on the cover in an illustration, I think, done by an American artist. But uh, his skill is fairly useless. It does a cool effect where it changes the background, but he's another one of those characters where you, you set him up and he basically auto battles, and he might not do skills you want. And all of the dances he does are based on background environments in the game, essentially like a geomancer and a reserver at the same time. Yeah, and uh, he can, if you use a dance in a environment that is, belongs to, like I think the something Rondo belongs in the underground uh, parts of the game, like the cave parts, like he'll be fine, but if you try to change up the dances, like say do a grassland dance in a uh, rock environment, like there's a 50-50 chance he'll stumble, but if he does get that dance and the environment's not meant for it, he can do some really powerful, especially healing spells, but it's it takes a lot of work, it's not usually worth the risk, but I just like having Mog because he's such a cool looking character. Yeah, he's a cute little mascot. He's a little mascot, he's a cool. Girl. I thought it was so funny that when you find him and you meet him and you get a chance to get, if you, if you examine where he was, you get that uh, charm of his, which basically turns off random encounters. And it's just funny to me that the game had that function built in and sort of like, well, it's late in the game, you might need this. Whereas the Pixar Master, you could just do that at any time. I don't know, <laughs> I, I, I read this recently, but apparently that was the charm belonged to his dead lover. That's, I've heard this lore before, I don't know if it was invented by fans, but I, it, it does start, it does ring a bell for me. Yeah, I, I can't remember if it's official or not, but I'm pretty sure it is, but either way, for mobs. I, I mean, the first time you go to that cave, it was like, it's full of mobs, it's and then like, there's only one left, so I guess, yeah, must have been. Poor mobs. Uh, yeah, he has one of the saddest backstories, because you, you watch this entire little cute race guy out, or I guess it happens off screen, but uh, still, still very tragic. Um, and then we have Realm, who was uh, formerly the most dangerous character in the entire game. <laughs> If you played the original uh, American SNES release, because she could just destroy your cartridge if you misuse her sketch ability. She is someone with a very, very high magic stat. I think that's probably owing to her heritage. But yeah, she is a pictomancer, and uh, something was wrong with the game, and you could really screw things up just by using pictomancy. So she really is the most powerful magic user in the group because she can screw up your game. I mean, the little book must always tell you not to get your cartridge wet, not to introduce any liquids. So like, you're playing with, playing with paint. You know, it's, it's right there in the box, don't do it. You got a point. Don't use the painter in your cartridge. Now we can safely play with Realm, though. Uh, Strago, I find him fairly useless. I apologize to all of our magic fans out there. Yeah. What's that, Nadi? I don't use him, like, except in the uh, the Burning House, he has a... He, the name is Aqua Breath, but in the original translation, it was Aqua Lung. So I was like, hey, Aqua Lung. <laughs> so that's the only time I really used him. Yeah, he has super low stats. The blue magic is useful, but it, it takes a lot more work to learn those, even more than like getting down at the speed. So it's if you really want to uh, put a lot of investment into a character who is kind of weak. Uh, and then Setzer is a gambler. He has the slot machine uh, ability. He also you can equip him with something that uh, that gives him the samurai ability from FF5, where you can throw money. Yeah, he can throw money. He has guild toss, and also there is a way to screw with his slots. And uh, I don't know it, but yeah, he's also since he's a gambler, he's also got that move that where you can like kill the party and the enemy party, and it's I think it's Joker or Joker White or something like that. It's just yeah, I don't really use him. I gave in Final Fantasy XIV though, I gave my Chocobo his barding, so I have a Chocobo that has like this really nice long like cloak that's black and it has like gold trimming. Yeah, getting that the Joker or the the death the death slots now is, is yeah. an achievement. Uh, I've never seen it. It's much easier to uh, restart your game in the new versions. Uh, let's go over the last couple. Uh, Maro is Yeti, uh, another Berserker. You just line him up and let him go because there is no controlling this man. <laughs> he he is, uh, yeah, just a um, just a wild animal that, for whatever reason, will join your party in the world of balance. I, I think it's because if Mod's Ma your buddy, and he'll join you. Yeah, you gotta get Mog, and Mog will get him to join you. And it's actually funny, you can see Umaro in the World of Balance. When you go back to Narsha at one point, uh, and you go into like the cave areas, you'll see him kind of pop out and look at you. And I was always like, how do I get that guy? And then you find out. But uh, I remember getting, I got, when I got the game, it was around Christmas. So I named him Bumble, because he looks so much like the Rudolph character. 
He has the blue face and the white fur. I call him Shaggy. That's a good name for yeah. him, too. <laughs> And then, uh, then Gogo, who uh, is actually from FF5, and uh, I guess technically the most powerful uh, player in the game, especially if you know how to use him effectively. But yeah, mine is his ability, and he can repeat ally actions even if it makes no sense um, to the game. He'll just repeat whatever the last action was, and it could be something as powerful as like casting two Ultima spells, or stealing, or whatever. It's just, he is very useful, but you have to take a little bit of work to, uh, to pick him up in the game. Gogo was a very interesting character in the original translation because since we had no idea what was going on with FF5, they skipped it over completely. There were so many weird fan theories about who Gogo was and why they were there, and there's this whole thing about how they were Daryl, like Setcho's lost lover. There's also something about them being like a politician. There's a whole there was a whole thing someone wrote up just for the hell of it about how he's supposed to be signify some politician in some faraway country. It was absolutely nuts what we did on there on the internet. Absolutely, one of the most busy. Uh, mono character designs. He's like wrapped in nine different kinds of quilts. <laughs> or they are, they are, yeah. I guess we don't know uh, 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 man or woman, who knows. First person non binary RPG character? Maybe? I'll take, their, I'll take the organization. I'll take it. Yes. Uh, I guess we have to wrap up pretty soon here. So I want uh, all of you on the panel here to call out uh, anything in like 30 seconds, something you want to call out about the game. I do want to call out something in the notes here. Uh, one thing I love as a kid is how easy it is to cheese this game. You can do uh, the Genji Glove and I believe the, the Offering Relic and basically get eight attacks physically, and then the Gem Box and the Offering fire off two spells with one MP each. Um, and that just will let you blast through everything. So the, the tools are available to break the game if you can find it. I just, you know, as someone who lives in Japan, I'm, I'm very well versed in what a Kappa is now. So I think it's really funny that, you know, 30 years ago, obviously, you know, Ted Woolsey, you know, looked at this character and was like, okay, we don't we don't have this thing, but I guess it's an imp, maybe? Yeah. Uh, and then it has a whole sort of side effect where, you know, you can, you can turn to an imp, you can turn other things to an imp, and there's like imp gear, and it's, um, you know, to me, you know, in 2024, I'm like, that's not, it's cap when we talk about. It. But it's just, it's funny that it has this whole legacy as, as something else, just because, you know, Ted made a call and, you know, he did what he could. Actually, in the 90s, there used to be, I think Nintendo Power issued a challenge, like, defeat Kepka with an imp party. And if you got, like, the imp equipment, it could be done very easily. So that's a really neat little side thing. Final Fantasy VI is full of uh, a lot of those. And I, I really appreciated the escalation of story, most of all, because the, the Empire is the threat. And then by the time he gets to the World of Ruin, like, it's funny, there's, in, in South Figaro, there's just an old, rusted magic armor, and there's a thief there laughing at it, saying, you know, imagine, like, when this was a problem. And now, like, everything's trying to kill us and poison us. Remember the Empire? That was great. Remember Occupation? Woo-hoo! <laughs> well, yes, that is all the time we have to talk about FF6. Honestly, we could sit here for many more hours and go on, but I think the people running the show would not like that. But, yeah, thanks to all of you for coming. Of course, we're Retronauts. You can find us online, wherever you find podcasts. And uh, you can support us online by going to patreon.com slash Retronauts. Lots of bonus shows. We'll be recording another show after this just about the characters and, and ranking them and locking them in a fierce battle to see who is the best FF6 character, but thank you all for coming. It's a great turnout this year. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And there you go. That's the end of this podcast episode of the Retronauts talking about Final Fantasy VI from 30 years ago. Can you believe it that that game came out in 1994? Time has really flown by. And you know what? I believe that. Final Fantasy VI, or three, however you want to call it, uh, is a game that is like a comfort food game, right? Uh, you keep going back to it. And if you haven't played it before, I encourage you to uh, give it a try and just make sure that you know going in that it is a very long game. Like it was mentioned in the podcast episode, I believe it was Nadia Oxford who had mentioned that it was... Um, I don't know, between 60 or 80 hours. So you're going to put some time in. So be prepared for that. And you know what? I am so happy that you've decided to take the time to listen or watch this podcast episode. I greatly appreciate it. And all I ask is to subscribe, like, leave a comment wherever you listen 
to your podcast or watch your podcast, which could be on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. Again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure this week, and I hope to see you again very, very soon. And until next time, take care, stay safe, and game on.